Welcome to a new video. Have you ever wondered whether or not white women abused their slaves as much as the men did? Turns out some of them were even worse. Are you new to this channel? Make sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell. And before we start, like the video. And the damn corn pones rot her out! 15. Sexual Exploitation The sexual abuse of enslaved men by white women during the slavery era in America is a subject that has been largely ignored in historical accounts. Yet it is a crucial aspect of slavery that is as unsettling as it is essential to comprehend. White women, especially those belonging to the planter class, were not just passive spectators in the institution of slavery. They were active participants who exploited their status within the slave system, including engaging in sexual relationships with enslaved men. In some situations, white women would force their slaves into intimate relationships. One court record from 18th century Pennsylvania provides a disturbing example of this. A white woman and an enslaved man were punished for having a child together. The woman was sentenced to be whipped and the man was ordered to never again meddle with white women upon pain of his life. The man defended himself in court by stating that the woman had enticed him and promised to marry him. This case suggests that promises of freedom may have been used as a method of enticement. In another case from 1813, an enslaved man named David was convicted of rape in Virginia. However, one neighbor testified in David's defense that the woman, Dolly Getz, had engaged in improper intimacy with David for three years prior to the rape accusation. Dolly and David were known to bed together in her father's house. The neighbor contended that Dolly had admitted that David's improper conduct arose from her persuasions and that she had frequently persuaded David to run away with her. Owners of slaves would systematically force the reproduction of slaves to boost their profits. This included enforced sexual relations between male slaves and women or girls, forced pregnancies of female slaves, and favoring women or young girls who could produce a relatively large number of children. The goal was to increase the slave population without the expense of purchase and to fill labor shortages caused by the abolition of the Atlantic slave trade. Slaveholders actively encouraged their enslaved property to reproduce by persuading, threatening, and forcing them into intimate relationships. Enslavers then either sold or exploited the children born of these sexual relationships for labor, earning themselves a profit. In this way, enslaved women were both producers and reproducers of slavery, and these children also grew up to unwillingly follow in their parents' footsteps. These cases illustrate how white women could manipulate and exploit enslaved men for their own purposes. They used their power and privilege within the slave system to coerce enslaved men into sexual relationships, often with promises of freedom or threats of punishment. However, it's important to note that these examples represent only a fraction of the sexual exploitation that occurred during this period. Many instances likely went unrecorded or were deliberately obscured to maintain the social order and uphold the myth of white female purity. 14. Abigail Adams owned many slaves. Abigail Adams, the spouse of the second U.S. President John Adams, is often celebrated for her advocacy for women's rights and education. However, her interaction with slavery is a multifaceted one that mirrors the paradoxes of her era. Born into a family that owned slaves, Abigail Adams was among the first ladies or White House hostesses who came from slave-owning families. Despite this, she was known to have been against slavery and had advocated for its abolition as early as the 1770s. She viewed slavery as a malevolent institution and a menace to the American democratic experiment. In a letter she penned on March 31, 1776, she expressed her skepticism about the commitment of Virginians to liberty given their treatment of enslaved people. She wrote, I doubt most of the Virginians have such passion for liberty as they claim they did, since they deprive D their fellow creatures of freedom. This quota illustrates her belief in the hypocrisy of slave owners who fought for their own freedom while dinning it to others. While residing in the president's mansion, Abigail Adams was uncomfortable with the presence of slaves as servants. Although she was sympathetic to the slaves and the hardships they endured, she was less compassionate toward the young nation's immigrant population.
This suggests a complex attitude towards different marginalized groups. Despite her personal opposition to slavery, Abigail Adams lived in a society where slavery was a significant aspect of life. Like their husbands, these first ladies benefited from enslaved labor daily and often shared a more intimate relationship with slavery than their spouse. Legally, female slave ownership varied between states and across time periods, and for many first ladies, including Abigail Adams, the enslaved individuals that they oversaw did not legally belong to them. However, white women like Abigail Adams played an important role in the management of enslaved labor, particularly those enslaved servants who worked within the home. This involvement in the institution of slavery is part of their legacy that is often overlooked. 13. Threats of false accusations. In contrast to male slave owners who often used physical force as a means of control, women employed unsettling and manipulative strategies to control and intimidate enslaved individuals. This approach involved threatening enslaved individuals with baseless accusations, a tactic that exacerbated the vulnerability and powerlessness already imposed by the institution of slavery. Unfounded allegations of theft or misconduct were a frequent tactic. They would assert that the enslaved person had pilfered food, property, or money, even in the absence of any supporting evidence. The aim of these allegations was to instill fear and insecurity, rendering the enslaved individuals more submissive. Enslaved individuals lived in perpetual fear of punishment, which could vary from lashings to confinement in harsh conditions. Unfounded allegations amplified this fear, as they suggested that even without actual misconduct, an enslaved person could face severe repercussions. This fear of punishment fostered an environment of compliance and submission. Enslaved individuals often established close relationships with each other as a form of support and unity in the face of hardship. Unfounded allegations disrupted these relationships as they could engender mistrust and suspicion among enslaved individuals. The apprehension that fellow slaves might be informants for the mistress or female slaveholder could further isolate individuals, making them more prone to manipulation. The psychological effects of unfounded allegations cannot be downplayed. Enslaved individuals constantly lived under the threat of violence and cruelty. Unfounded allegations added to their emotional load, fostering anxiety, mistrust, and a sense of powerlessness. The use of unfounded allegations by women in positions of power within the slaveholding hierarchy reinforced the broader power dynamic of slavery. It demonstrated how the enslaved had no means to defend themselves or seek justice. It also underscored the ways in which those in authority could manipulate and control the lives of those under their care. Despite the constant threat of unfounded allegations and other forms of mistreatment, many enslaved individuals displayed remarkable resilience and found ways to resist oppression. They often relied on their community bonds, resourcefulness, and occasional acts of defiance to preserve their sense of self and dignity. 12. Martha Gibbs Martha Gibbs, a wealthy Irish woman, was a prominent figure in the antebellum South who owned and operated a large steam sawmill on the Warner Bayou in Vicksburg, where it emptied into the Mississippi River. She was known for her wealth and her assertive nature, with one of her former slaves describing her as a big, rich Irish woman who showed no fear of anyone, including men. Gibbs owned a significant number of slaves, so many, in fact, that she had to build two sets of whitewashed quarters with glass windows to house them all. She also built a nice church with glass windows and a brass cupola for their worship. While she provided them with good food, she also worked them hard. In line with other slave owners throughout the South, Gibbs employed an overseer to ensure that the people she kept enslaved performed the tasks delegated to them. However, Gibbs also oversaw her overseer. Almost every morning, she buckled on two guns and came out to the place to personally ensure that things were running smoothly. Despite the abolition of slavery in 1865, Gibbs continued to exploit her enslaved workers. As Union troops made their way through the South freeing enslaved people, white women like Gibbs would move enslaved people farther from the soldiers' path, 
Gibbs even took enslaved people to Texas and forced them to work for her at gunpoint until 1866, a year after slavery's formal abolition. This blatant disregard for the law and human rights paints a grim picture of Gibbs's character and her treatment of enslaved individuals. Her actions serve as a stark reminder of the harsh realities of slavery and the length some slave owners went to maintain their control and economic advantage. 11. Forced Labor During the antebellum era, enslaved individuals were expected to perform a wide range of labor-intensive tasks. On plantations, labor was often divided along gender lines, with women typically responsible for tasks such as sewing, cooking, quilting, cleaning the house, supervising the children, and serving as midwives. However, many enslaved women also worked in the fields. Enslaved individuals were not only expected to perform their assigned tasks, but also to bear, nourish, and rear the children whom slaveholders sought to add to their labor force. As house slaves, women served as domestic servants, cooking, sewing, acting as maids, and rearing the planter's children. White women played a significant role in this system. Elite white women used slave labor in household production, but did not spend all their days in leisure. Their privileged status allowed them to oversee rather than physically participate in the domestic sphere. While the master controlled the plantation, the slave mistress was the administrator of domestic labor. In fact, white women were active participants in the institution of slavery. They exploited their position within the slave system, which included forming sexual relationships with enslaved men. 10. Eliza Lucas Pinckney Eliza Lucas Pinckney, a significant figure in 18th century South Carolina, is renowned for her pioneering work in indigo cultivation, which significantly boosted the colony's economy. However, it's crucial to note that her accomplishments were built on the backs of enslaved individuals. Pinckney's relationship with her slaves was a study in contrasts. She was known to have broken societal norms by teaching some of her slaves literacy skills. She spent considerable time imparting education to the young slaves on her plantation, a practice considered radical during an era when slaves were not recognized as human beings and educating them was deemed unnecessary. However, the success of Pinckney's endeavors was heavily reliant on the forced labor and ingenuity of her slaves. Eliza Lucas Pinckney's receipt book contains 139 recipes, 98 culinary, 39 medical, and two household related. These recipes paint a picture of Eliza experimenting and refining her own mixtures in the kitchen. Yet this image masks a different truth. The surviving manuscript is notably free of food stains and smudges, suggesting that it is not just Eliza's work, but also the work of enslaved people, their thoughts, inventions, ideas, and alterations. Eliza not only exploited her slaves' physical labor, but also their creative power, their knowledge of native ingredients' medicinal power in her remedies. 9. Extreme Physical Punishment The system of slavery was a harsh regime that subjected enslaved individuals to severe punishments, often inflicted by their masters and mistresses. These punishments were both physical and psychological, intended to establish and maintain power and control over the enslaved. Flogging was a prevalent form of physical punishment on many plantations. It was often performed publicly, intended to serve as a deterrent to the larger enslaved community. This form of punishment was not exclusive to male masters. Slave mistresses also meted out punishments. Domestic slaves often faced punishment from the mistress who oversaw the household chores. Implements used by mistresses included a bundle of hickory sprouts seasoned in the fire, shovels, chairs, tongs, brooms, and oak clubs. However, the punishments were not limited to physical violence. Enslaved individuals were subjected to sexual abuse and rape, often perpetrated by their masters and mistresses. Enslaved women were forced to yield to the sexual demands of their masters, but this abuse was not confined to just women. There is a long history of black men being sexually abused as well. This sexual abuse was more about asserting power than about sex. Enslaved individuals were also punished for perceived transgressions or disobedience. These transgressions could include working at a slow pace, breaking a law, such as running away, leaving the plantation without permission, 
insubordination, or impudence as defined by the owner or overseer. Sometimes abuse was inflicted simply to reassert the dominance of the master or overseer over the enslaved individual. The punishments endured by slaves were severe and brutal. They served as a constant reminder of their status and were designed to suppress any thoughts of rebellion or escape. The legacy of these punishments continues to impact descendants of enslaved people today, serving as a stark reminder of a dark chapter in human history. Eight, Dolly Madison owned slaves. Dolly Madison, wife of the fourth US president, James Madison, was a slave owner. Despite her Quaker background, which typically opposed slavery, Dolly Madison owned and sold slaves throughout her life. Several slaves resided with Mrs. Madison during her time in Washington, D.C. When she needed to raise funds, she offered a reliable, valuable man for sale who had been raised on Mr. Madison's old farm. To avoid being sent to the cotton fields or cane breaks of the South, he persuaded a prominent Northern Senator to advance the purchase money for him and give him time to work it out. She also owned a woman in her 50s and her 15-year-old daughter. Mrs. Madison once called this girl into her parlor under the pretense of fetching some water, but in reality to show her to a Georgian slave driver. The girl quickly understood she was to be sold. Her mistress arranged with the buyer to send the unprotected child to the pump at a specified hour on a predetermined day when he could conveniently seize her and take her away. Soon after this event, Mrs. Madison offered the mother for sale. Fortunately, she found a family in the city who needed a capable woman like herself. The price was paid to her mistress, and she is now at work with the prospect of freedom sometime. Upon James Madison's death, he left his remaining slaves to his wife, Dolly, asking her only to sell her slaves with their consent. However, Dolly did not adhere to this request, selling the Montpellier plantation and many slaves to pay off the Madison's debts. The reason given for Mrs. Madison's actions in these cases is that poverty and want forced it upon her. It is said that she did not have cash to go to the market with from day to day. The members of her family were therefore disposed of one after another to furnish her with the means of living. Seven, unnamed woman from Harriet Jacobs book. Harriet Jacobs memoir, Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl, offers a chilling insight into the lives of enslaved women particularly their interactions with white women, often referred to as mistresses. Jacobs, writing under the pseudonym Linda Brent, provides a nuanced analysis of the social dynamics within slave-owning households. The book mentions someone Harriet only refers to as Mrs. Flint, though it is unclear whether or not this is a pseudonym. She is portrayed as heartless and egocentric. Mrs. Flint's husband, Dr. Flint, sexually harassed and threatened Harriet while Mrs. Flint looked on, filled with jealousy and determined to punish Harriet. Often, white mistresses behaved with shocking cruelty towards female slaves, frequently out of jealousy or fear that the slaves were sexually attracted to their husbands. Harriet criticizes this behavior and the demonstrated lack of empathy for sexually abused slaves, while also suggesting that it partly stems from the white women's powerlessness in their own marriages. She provides numerous accounts of the specific abuse meted out to slaves by white mistresses, often in retaliation for their husbands' infidelities. In response to the common practice of male slave owners fathering children with their slaves, most wives don't confront their husbands, over whom they have no real control, but vent their anger on the slaves who are blameless. Jacobs describes instances in which white women encourage their husbands to sell off illegitimate children thus punishing slave mothers for their own abuse. Six, slaves were used as dowries. The tradition of using slaves as dowries was widespread during the period of slavery. A dowry typically is the wealth, goods, or property that a woman brings into her marriage. In societies where slavery was practiced, slaves were often incorporated as part of the dowry. Parents who owned slaves usually gave their daughters more enslaved people than land. This meant that their identities as white Southern women were linked to the ownership of other people. Owning a large number of enslaved people made a woman a more desirable marriage prospect. The process of socializing women and girls into owning slaves started at an extremely young age 
White girls were educated in slave ownership, discipline, and mastery sometimes from infancy, even receiving enslaved people as gifts when they were as young as nine months old. This resulted in white women becoming deeply invested in slavery. Stephanie E. Jones Rogers, a history professor at the University of California, Berkeley, discovered that white women bought, sold, managed, and sought the return of enslaved people, in whom they had a significant economic interest. Their exposure to the slave market began in their homes when they were little girls, sometimes infants. Citing interviews with formerly enslaved people that the Works Progress Administration conducted in the 1930s, Jones Rogers shows that part of white children's training in plantation management involved beating enslaved people. As adults, white women often separated black women from their babies so they could nurse the white mistress's baby instead. Once married, white women fought in courts to preserve their legal ownership over enslaved people, as opposed to their husband's ownership, and often won. In conclusion, slaves were often used as dowries and given to young girls as gifts to socialize them into owning slaves. This practice resulted in white women becoming deeply invested in slavery and actively participating in the slave market. Five, dehumanization. As we've learned, throughout the antebellum era, white women were active contributors to the dehumanization of slaves. Marie LaLaurie of New Orleans is a notorious and horrific example of this. She was exposed for torturing and murdering her slaves, which shocked her community. However, what stood out was her deep economic involvement in slavery and the extreme control she exerted over her slaves. Slaves on many plantations were subjected to regular beatings for minor infractions. The violation of slave women was not limited to forced intimacy with white men, but also included forced marriages with slave men. These women were often compelled to accept husbands they did not choose for breeding purposes. White women used their status as moral guardians to address various social issues they believed were leading to societal decay. This ideology confined middle-class white women to the domestic sphere, where they were tasked with educating children and maintaining household virtue. However, these women faced significant restrictions. Under coverture laws, men gained legal control over their wives' property, and mothers had no legal rights over their children. Women were also unable to initiate divorce, make wills, sign contracts, or vote. Four, single women and widows owned slaves too, not just married women. In the era before the American Civil War, it was not uncommon for single women, widows, and unmarried females in the South to legally own and utilize enslaved individuals. The economic benefits of slave ownership were a significant factor in this practice. These women saw the potential value in enslaved labor and used it as a means to maintain or improve their economic status. They managed their enslaved individuals with the aim of maximizing productivity, which could provide income or sustenance. The enslaved individuals owned by these women, their labor was crucial to the daily comfort and operation of these households. In situations where the woman owned larger properties like farms or plantations, the enslaved individuals were involved in agricultural work such as planting and harvesting crops, caring for livestock, and maintaining the property's infrastructure. This labor was vital for income generation and self-sufficiency. The way these women treated their enslaved individuals varied greatly. Some were kind mistresses who provided better living conditions and showed empathy, while others were cruel and used severe punitive measures. The treatment largely depended on the individual values and attitudes of the mistresses. Like male slaveholders, these single women and widows had significant control over their enslaved individuals. They had the power to decide on matters related to labor, discipline, and living conditions of their enslaved people. For single women seeking to marry or remarry, slave ownership was a useful tool for attracting potential suitors. A woman who owned many slaves was considered a desirable marriage prospect. Young girls raised in slave-owning homes understood that their dowry, inheritance, and social status could improve their prospects for marriage and were often symbolized by their human property. However, slave ownership was not just about economics. It also had social and political implications. It reinforced the power dynamics of the time and further entrenched slavery as an institution.
The use of enslaved people as dowries served to enhance the social and economic status of white women while continuing the dehumanization and commodification of slaves. 3. Marie Delphine. La Lurie. La Lurie, a well-known Creole socialite in New Orleans in the early 19th century, was notorious for her severe mistreatment of enslaved individuals, particularly males. Her grand mansion on Royal Street in the French Quarter was a facade for the dark secret she harbored within its walls. The horrific conditions endured by male slaves under her ownership have been documented through numerous accounts and testimonies. A fire in 1834 at the LaLaurie Mansion revealed the extent of her cruelty. Firefighters who arrived to put out the flames stumbled upon a gruesome scene. As reported in the New Orleans Bee on April 11, 1834, Witnesses described seeing several horribly mutilated slaves suspended by their necks, their limbs stretched and torn. Near the kitchen lay the body of a woman who had been dead for nearly four years. The account paints a chilling picture of the sadistic treatment male slaves suffered in the LaLaurie mansion. Physical torture, mutilation, and extreme forms of restraint were horrifyingly commonplace. It's important to note that these abuses were not confined to male slaves. Women and children also experienced horrific treatment in this house of horrors. Further investigations revealed that male slaves were regularly subjected to floggings, whippings, and other forms of physical abuse. The New Orleans Bee reported on April 10, 1834, that slaves were beaten with a whip attached to a cowhide handle and hung up for hours by their necks with their hands tied behind them. In addition to physical abuse, Marie LaLaurie's male slaves were denied basic human rights and forced to live in deplorable conditions. Many were kept in small, filthy cells and suffered from severe malnutrition and neglect. They were treated as subhuman, stripped of their dignity, and subjected to degrading treatment. The revelation of the atrocities committed in the LaLaurie mansion shocked New Orleans society and led to Marie LaLaurie's eventual flight from the city. The fate of her male slaves after her departure remains uncertain. However, their story serves as a stark reminder of the unimaginable suffering endured by countless enslaved individuals at the hands of cruel slaveholders like Marie Delphine LaLaurie. Her legacy is a chilling testament to the brutality of slavery in the American South during this dark period in history. 2. The Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 the Fugitive Slave Act, enacted on September 18, 1850 by the 31st U.S. Congress, was a contentious component of the Compromise of 1850. This compromise sought to appease both the slaveholding South and the Free North. The act exacerbated fears in the North of a conspiracy to expand the power of slavery. The law stipulated that any slaves who had escaped were to be returned to their enslaver upon capture. It also obligated officials and citizens of free states to cooperate in this process. This meant that even in the free states of the North, escaped slaves could be captured and returned to slavery in the South. Officials who failed to arrest an alleged runaway slave could be fined $1,000, equivalent to about $35,180 today, creating a significant financial incentive to enforce the law, the responsibility for locating, returning and prosecuting escaped slaves fell to the federal government. The Fugitive Slave Act played a significant role in escalating tensions over slavery in the United States and was a contributing factor to the outbreak of the American Civil War. The act was finally repealed on June 28, 1864. Born Martha Washington. Martha Washington, born Martha Dandridge in 1731, was a member of a prominent Virginia planter family. She married her first husband, Daniel Park Custis, a wealthy plantation owner at a young age. Unfortunately, he died in 1757, leaving Martha a widow with a large estate that included five plantations and nearly 300 enslaved individuals. This inheritance significantly increased Martha's ownership of enslaved people. Under Martha's management, the Custis estate, which included the White House plantation, later known as the Arlington Plantation, and the new Kent County Plantation, became one of Virginia's most prosperous. These properties heavily relied on the labor of enslaved individuals, primarily for tobacco cultivation, a highly profitable crop at the time.
Even during the Revolutionary Era, when her husband George Washington was instrumental in the American Revolution and the founding of the nation, Martha continued to manage these plantations. The economic success of these plantations, which contributed significantly to the Washington's wealth, was largely due to enslaved labor. In 1789, when George Washington became president, Martha assumed the role of the nation's first First Lady. Despite being admired for her grace and dignity, her status as a slaveholder was controversial. This was due to the contradiction between slavery and the ideals of freedom and liberty that the new nation was founded upon. It's worth noting that George Washington's views on slavery evolved over time. In his will, he expressed his wish to free some of his enslaved individuals after his death, which would occur after Martha's passing. However, Martha did not share her husband's sentiments and did not free any enslaved individuals during her lifetime. Martha Washington's ownership of enslaved individuals reflects the social and economic norms of her time. Slavery was deeply ingrained in Southern society and owning enslaved laborers was common among the planter class. Her life story highlights the moral and ethical complexities of America's founding era when principles of liberty and justice were championed while human bondage was simultaneously perpetuated. Well, that's all we have for today. If you liked today's video, please leave a like and subscribe to our channel. Be sure to check out our page and watch more videos as well. Thank you for watching, and we will see you in the next one.